Yeah, welcome back everyone for cloud computing and big data or practical lecture 11 one uh, using data mining and recommender techniques in clouds. The first part of the lecture, we largely looked on association rule mining, which is one specific form of data mining, which is incredibly often used. And in a way is a very cheap computation and a very cheap um, algorithm, so to speak, a very trivial algorithm. Um, we learned it has, for instance, no personalization, right? So it's not personalized recommendation of what to buy. It's rather, you know, showing you in general, diapers are bought with beer. And this statement is, of course, loaded. It should be always put in the context of the origin of the data. So it's which store it comes from, which country it's applied to. We discussed that, of course, this beer and diapers came a little bit about the UK, let's say, um, personal habit of going in the evening rather to the pub of having, let's say, their beer at home. It's just a cultural thing there. If you have been in UK and have friends there, you know that. But essentially, um, of course, this statement may be not everywhere true, right? Especially in other countries, maybe pubs are not that frequent visiting. So, of course, it should be handled with care. But if you have some data and you have a shop downtown, chances are that with this simple algorithm that we have seen like a priori mafia or even FP grows to really scale up a little bit. And you have, let's say lots of data sets, the chances are that you have good recommendations for what things to buy. And always think about that these techniques are almost never applied today in many, many shops. It's incredible even to see that in the sector in Germany and in advanced countries in Europe, very many shops still don't have these systems on a day-to-day -day basis in the shop. Uh, of course, giant shops and big shops have that. Um, also, online shops have that. But it comes to the real, let's say, um, the, the real in-store habits. Many people still operate like the gut feeling. And this is good for a singleton or double ton, as Shadi was pointing out. But as soon as you go to, let's say, triple tons or three products are always based, bought together, uh, then the human mind often ends and basically cannot really follow automatically everywhere and see um, and can recommend these, let's say, different products together. And that's where these systems are really good at. They are very bad in the sense when you have very small shopping baskets, right? Of course, these algorithms are very trivial and powerful if you have, um, let's say, shopping baskets in a supermarket where you have 20 products, 30 products, 40 products, um, or even 10. If you go to an apotheque, um, and let's say you have Pano Deal Hot with another Pano Deal. Um, that's not big shopping baskets. So I think here the association rules usually don't work so powerful as, of course, in other ones where you would expect a much higher frequency of products, a much higher support of products um, from the product portfolio. And, and here goes the lecture. Essentially, of course, association rule mining can help you, but is not necessarily always the best thing that you can do. And the second takeaway message from the first part is really important. It had no personalization, right? So you have a general statement of a general store of transactions. And this is a little bit at the end of the lecture, what we now motivated. It's quite limited. So what about if I can put the personality of people in, of users that use that? And although I don't know the personality, can I learn it? Can I learn features from this personality? Even if I not can basically point to it later and say, well, um, this is a so-and-so called person um, and, and can really point to specific features, maybe the whole in the sum, basically of all the personal features brings something. And of course, a very clear indicator of this are these kind of product-based recommenders with tags where you say a uh, person that, let's say, has seen already in Netflix 10 movies of um, sci-fi movies as a likelihood of probably also looking at 11 or 12 or 13 movies on it. So this is not directly rocket science, but of course, this is more rather general aspect. If you know sci-fi a little bit, there's still a big fraction between the world of Star Trek and Star Wars, for instance. People like Star Trek or hate Star Wars and the other way around. So the, because they're kind of very different in the approaches, very different in, in how they are basically, um, yeah, uh, having storylines and so on. And of course, there are people that like both or there are people that hate sky fi or science fiction. You know the game from the movie, so I don't really want to elaborate on this too much. 
but this is still putting people into boxes in, in very big boxes, so to speak, based on tags like Western comics. These days, probably Marvel comics movies would be one another box. So essentially a very coarse grained approach. And what we learned here and basically now is, is coming to this collaborative filtering systems. Here you have a much more fine grained approach to this. So still in a way you put people to boxes, but we learn so-called embedded um, features in the data and to, to really make it work, um, to have a much more fine grained steering of decisions for recommendations. And that is the takeaway message of the second part that you learn here, but also of your assignment three that you basically have to do. Um, and basically, again, the script will be provided to you. Also, as I said to you, orthogonal, what we want to explore a little bit is like when you basically get this task in a company now and you said, you know, please, please create me a recommender. Um, you have been in Morris course, you know how that scales up in HPC, you know the AI algorithms for it. So you just should do the same, but maybe not with movies, but with our customers, what will they buy? So then you have here the basic set to do this. You have the same script you maybe can extend to other products. You have the same process I want to go through with you, which is this crisp DM process. And if you align according to this process, provide documentation for your bosses and so on, and, and have this very accurately in these different phases basically written down, chances are that basically you get a road of good feedback for it, even if you know the, the result is not always, let's say, 100%, um, of course, looking on the evaluations on the recommendation engine. You know, the Netflix price from 1 million was one, of course, and actually it just improved by a couple of percentage, so to speak. The Netflix recommendation engine was not that perfect and 100%. But still, you can see that just by improving a recommendation by a couple of percentages can, of course, make a big difference for a company, especially when it's Netflix and, you know, having lots of different users and lots of different movies. And here we want to connect a little bit. So when we look abstractly on Netflix or on Amazon Prime, whatever movie, um, you know, online streaming service is there, it doesn't matter in a way. You can imagine we always would have data sets of people that have looked the movie and this could be done in different areas. You would say, as I said earlier, explicit feedback would be probably given, which means someone likes really a movie or hates it. Uh, that would be something, or you have a numerical scheme of saying you rate it between one and five, which is very common. Um, implicit feedback is sometimes used if you don't have that data, essentially in a numerical rating, but you know at least he looked or not looked the movie. And essentially, this is also something important, right? That you not look the movie is also data. And with this, it's an implicit feedback that the one that you looked in a way you like more than the ones you not looked. And now the key aspects of this to really do this problem understanding, right? In the very first phase is to, to think in two ways. So firstly, we want to have something which basically, of course, recommends movies that basically um, have some similarity to movies the user itself has liked in the past, right? So this is an important part. So of course you want to be not a different user. This is basically um, yourself. You look and like some certain movies. And, and now the second part of this business understanding in this particular area is you don't want to have this recommendation from everyone, right? Because you're not like everyone, you're similar to a user um, in some kind, in some form. And this is something what these algorithms actually exploit. They try to get similarity of users. And so you basically recommend not only movies that you probably yourself like, but also those that other similar users like that are very similar to you. And with this, you get a recommendation for a movie that is of course much more accurate to the point than let's say compared now to the association rule mining, where would be basically a general tendency that maybe everybody who has looked Shrek, of course, looked also Batman, right? The Dark Knight Rises. And you see here as an example, it would be not the case. Um, just because everybody basically was doing it here or more, let's say, association rules would point you to the certain fact that, okay, um, in this more shopping basket view, um, this might be highly likelihood for The Dark Knight Rises. But um, it's not so obvious. And of course, we need some very smart algorithm to go there. 
but I hope the idea of the business or of the, let's say, approach of this collaborative filtering is getting clear. We really have to get the similarity right here of users and the similarity of movies. Hence, we have a 2D problem here. And if you want to do this in a 1D, um, you can imagine it's not really working out very nicely, right? So there's a so-called embedding approach. I come to this again and again, which is essentially shown here. Um, you have certain embeddings of one dimension here. Each just basically says you have just a scalar in order to compute this, um, which is essentially more a 2D problem. And of course, you want to say that adults get another recommendation, like let's say smaller children. And you know from our experience that you know mid edge would probably look Harry Potter. The kids are not allowed to see that yet, but they would probably look Shrek and have let's say other movies recommended in this sector or this scheme. And then basically others which are more gray haired here, indicating perhaps the age would be looking much more memento and you know Dark Knight Rises and other interesting movies that are basically not in this category. And when you do this now on a very long vector notation, um, you can imagine, of course, you can make it for the movies themselves and say, yes, we can code that from minus one to one, perhaps on a scale and say, um, we do the, the kids movies on the one and then the grown up movies on the other side. And then in the middle, it will be all, you know, numerical scale, which we can incorporate. But still, we would missing a little bit this 2D nature because we're talking at the same time also about the personalities. So, the interesting thing, however, we want to learn that automatically, right? So this embedded features, we don't do them to do in our own. So here's the machine learning or the data mining happening. What we have is nicely this matrix, right? So this is our data set, right? We know that these certain people have looked certain movies at some point in time, and you can add more dimensions to it um, and so on. But let's say if you simplify it here, in a very, let's say, uh, easy way to follow, you could say that this is a matrix that we have and we need something which would be this kind of two, let's say, scalars here that we want to compute in order to create this matrix. So this is basically the idea of splitting up what gave rise to the matrix. And having this in one dimension is relatively, um, let's say, not so really powerful. So why not doing this in multidimensional ideas of basically doing matrix multiplication and dot products that we already know a little bit from machine learning before, but which is very important. We still keep the idea that basically these embeddings that we have maybe should be closer to one for movies that the, that we expect the user like very much. So here you see the gray here, people one, and the dot product of those times one would be, you know, then for momento very high um, part And when you think about with this gray hair lady looking Shrek, which is on the other end of the scale, is one times minus one, uh, probably minus one. So don't recommend that movie, right? So in the end, uh, we come to a situation where um, we need to optimize these vectors to something which should satisfy our matrix as best as possible. You can imagine it's not completely 100% possible to do so because humans are complex. Uh, actually, movies are complex. And when you then have just one D here that explains is, of course, maybe by far too little to capture this complexity. Also, if you have, let's say, 60,000 movies and 100,000 users, as let's say really stream providers have. Hence, we have to look and see how we model this and maybe also think about um, when we would handcraft this, the features in 2D, it would probably give a better comparison why we need a 2D embedding space, right? So here you would see now um, this 1D, as we said, would be in a way very limited because we probably see really a dimension here um, and the personalities would be not really captured um, as strongly as basically just the age here where you have the adult and children way and where you maybe have much more from the personality included uh, people liking blockbusters or uh, more like art house movies and so forth. So this is what you want to craft this as handcrafted features in a way. But the point now of this machine learning that we have in this collaborative filtering approach is to learn automatically these 2D features that you see here. So hence we talk about again, a matrix. And of course the, the good thing 
for optimization, you know, we have to check something against in a supervised setup, so to speak, check something against the ground truth. So what is really true? And that's what we have, right? So luckily we have this matrix of users, which actually shows us already which movies they like, don't like, maybe in a one to five rating or here very simplified, what actually movies they have seen and what not. And now the goal of recommendation in context you can imagine is now, what would be the next recommendation I would provide? Or in other words, if I basically look on this movie and I will switch to it and I see actually my system says it is not recommended for you to look this movie based on your other moving have factors. Or it will be having a small recommend at the bottom. You have looked previously this and this. And so that's why we recommend that particular one to you. And I gave you the example now in a 2D, of course, the dot product is a bit more um, elaborate. And here, these features are not at all obvious, right, which are here. This would be just if you, let's say, more or less handcrafted here to get the understanding. The goal of the machine learning would to find be this numbers. So what numbers would satisfy in a dot product fashion? Essentially, this matrix. Right, so that we come to something which is here now the example again with Shrek that if you make here the, let's say the matrix multiplication, this dot product, it's only of 0 0.1 times one plus then one times the next feature here times minus one and minus one carries a lot. It means, okay, that's not really something I would recommend. Hence, everything which goes towards one, uh, like a 0 0.9 or something, 0 0.8, I would rather then, of course, um, basically provide as a recommendation. And it's of course not to provide something which you don't really think it's good, then you better leave that as a recommendation out for the users. Otherwise they maybe over time don't really like your system anymore or don't trust your judgment on recommendations. So in the end, these embeddings now are the key to understanding for you. And always think about that these numbers are fake numbers. These need to be learned, right? So this is something where the optimization will help us. And um, the interesting thing is this can be done automatically using optimization techniques, which is then the idea of this collaborative filtering. Um, and the, in a way, what you see in this 2D approach is that you would have one embeddings of users with similar preferences will be very close together. So if you take here the distance or see essentially then into this vector, and now the, the 2D here is of course a simplification. You could think about the personalities better maybe reflected in 20 properties, right? Here, the two come now from adult versus children, blockbusters, art house, let's have 2D, but you have many different factors. Basically, the, the maybe the income is a usual factor. Um, there are many different incomes for people. There's a different, let's say, um, uh, sports, non-sports element in it. Um, lots of different factors um, that you can actually use here. For, to motivate in a way that the 2D space would be maybe even too trivial, right? Of course, however, on computing ends, you have to think about now when you have a 200D vector explaining a personality, which might be actually true that we are very complex, like 200 dimensions, um, then you go and pay the price, right? For the all the computing. And this is just the user space I'm talking about. Think about that the movie space is also, of course, um, very loaded. You can have a 2D movie, let's say, embedded feature set, which means you have similar users together, uh, similar movies together here. But the key point is, of course, a movie is much more, um, let's say, elaborate these days as well. So it could be easily maybe also 10D or 20D or even more to explain really all the differences, right? Um, think about historic movies or future movies which is, would be adding another dimension here, orthogonal to the use, so the kind of 3D approach, or many other factors in movies that you basically know. Uh, the lead actor is a very big thing, in, in basically, in movies. So liking the lead actor might be a very good property, strong lead actor, popular lead actor, because, of course, many people just switch to a movie, not because the movie genre is maybe interesting, but because, let's say, Sean Connery is doing it, or Harrison Ford is in the movie, so... I'm going to look that movie. Um, in this sense, um, I think you get the story that this is a simplified way to understand it better. But of course, now computing is something where the cloud is very good in. So you can here extend this, the kind of dimensions. 
And also what Shadi was saying, they experimented with this, took this Google Collab notebook and experimented for this, of course, for the parfumery. You can now immediately see, uh, maybe have still users with different, let's say, elements of dimensions here for personalities, but you don't have to take movies, right? You can have other data from products in stores up to, um, you know, software that people download from, let's say, a, a software repository in your company and and things like that. So basically, this is an important factor. The drawback of these things are uh, by what we also found very much in practice, what perhaps Shadi has also put a little bit on. Of course, getting the user IDs and the personality and personal data about those people is sometimes hard, right? People work with anonymization and so on. But we have discussed with many shop owners that, okay, the normal transactions, not a problem. What people bought in generally, I can give out. As soon as you talk with shop owners or let's say any other company about their user data, it's a different story. So it's not anymore so easily for a data scientist to get to it. Even if you can say, let's say, I don't care about the names, right? So basically you say name one, name two, name three. Important is, of course, that you'd get the different user IDs that look the movies. If you don't have that, then you're back to more or less association rule mind. Because you need here the user IDs or the movie IDs, on the other hand, to, to really, you know, make the difference. And especially this connection. Actually, another one just for practical input before I go in too much details how it really looks when you do this in practice. Um, uh, firstly, again, if you have too little um, products, this makes also hardly sense. You can imagine if you just have three software products on your web page from your software company, um, then essentially this is very hard to, to make the best recommendation or I mean in every recommendation would be true almost if you have just three products and someone already bought one product, 50-50% of the other. Now, the point is, of course, having big, bigger products here. And the second aspect of, is, of course, the better the ratings um, and more fine granular, the better is your model. What do I mean by this? You see here a very simplified manner again, right? When we say yes and no, um, we found in practice it's incredibly important to have ratings from one to five, for instance. But our experience also reveals that you don't have that usually, you know, and you cannot also go to Amazon and steal their um, ratings. Actually, we tried partly very short and then basically we came to problems because, you know, we were absorbing online data. And of course, people notice this. They look on their servers. People steal data from that. So there you can be also easily in trouble. I mean, it was basically then that we said it was just a test we wanted to see. So you cannot just reuse Amazon, let's say, ratings now from all the different products, as an example, in their shop and use it for yours. Also, chances are that you maybe don't have exactly the same product portfolio, so it's a lot of work anyway, meaning that, unfortunately, if you go to downtown Reykjavik, I guess as well, there will be many different stores that still have not uh, included a rating program for their users right, to, in, to encourage or to, to motivate essentially this shopping behavior. One way what was actually working a lot into this direction were these customer loyalty cards. With that, you started to have an engagement and see what products actually people have bought over time, which of course then enables you to start and engage in these algorithms I show you now here, compared to the normal association rules that you probably always have to have in a way because you anyhow, anyhow have to show with taxes and so on how much you actually actually sold. But here, of course, these are really constant, let's say, major challenges. And if you are, let's say, creating your own company and, and sell products, sell software, sell other products, what I would encourage you is always think about the future in these algorithms. So start early on of making a rating program for your users. Take the painful time, go back to your users and do a survey. Did you like it? Did you not like it? You would be in, you know, in a much better position a year down the road when you have collected all that data, what you can do with the data than just, you know, counting on your normal transaction receipts. And of course, this is uh, now really an impactful practice. So let's go back to a little bit of theory, how that works, which is not that complicated. 
you can imagine um, we have our, let's say, label data set, if you want to call it like this, in a way saying that we have these different users. We know exactly what movies they looked through these transaction IDs. So we can, let's say, transfer this, of course, to this particular matrix. And now we would to find something which does, let's say, a, a dot product between these two matrices, right? And to come to certain factors that would explain the, the given data that we have. So in a way, our learning goal is to reproduce a matrix that can be transferred back to our own one here. Of course, we do this in numerical situations and we can actually put an optimization algorithm around it, which is here formalized in saying just the minimum, um, going to the minimum of all this kind of, um, let's say summarized elements taking here the square arrow again between let's say the multiplication of the dot product here and the original that we have right that's the beauty that's our supervised setup we always can come back did he really look that and does it fit with the numerical value here and this is an optimization problem um, which we in a way already know a little bit and can be nicely fit into something called squared error uh, in, in SGD, sorry, and that you know already from the six and seven lectures, so we don't need to go much into this. And the different modifications to this algorithms that you see here, um, that is also not so important now for you to take away. Um, we take here, for instance, this as an example where you can have then also basically a small weight additionally onto it, um, another set of hyperparameter, if you want, in, in another, uh, let's say, way of calling it to make it a bit more interesting and a little bit more, uh, say, parameterized to do um, more interesting elements in the optimization here. But essentially, that it boils down is essentially this important part here. And there are many different others, um, essentially, that here and there have this matrix factorization in, a, in a, a little bit different story, but essentially we all go the same line down the road. They all go down the, the idea of creating or recreating this matrix that basically explains hopefully your ratings very well. And you can imagine now if you have a zero and one, it's not so powerful, but if you have a rating between one and five, then the numerical power of making this matrix much more elaborate would be also much more realistic, much more powerful to, to be closer to ratings and you know giving a much more fine-grained uh, recommendation, right? It's something between zero and one. Yeah, you can look the movie or not. It's different than you would say, well, this would be a strong five for you. So you would really love that movie. So this is something which, of course, gives them the different rise to this um, algorithms and the different power they really have. So... In a way, um, lots of practical insights from our real work, uh, basically using these systems in day-to-day -day business. Also Shadi, who is doing this daily. Let's come to a little bit also how you would use that now in the assignment. Um, I put you here in our um, Canvas overview, essentially the link to this um, recommender engine exercise, which is a typical call-up notebook that you have basically provided by Google. I found this very nice because it gives you lots of descriptive information to it. And uh, in this sense, there's no point of reproducing this. So we're just reusing this with thanks to Google. And um, as I said, we even use that for our production versions in a tuned version for retail in our um, elements. Um, so it's, it serves as a very nice basis also for you to do. When you do this, um, and you will see I have similar aspects also in my, in my slides. Um, you, when you get this, make a copy in your own drive, right? You, when you go to this particular link here, you see um, this is the general, let's say, page here. And then you can, in call up, go to this page. And what I would recommend usually is always make your own copy in the drive to modify it and so on. And then, as you know from previous Google call up exercises, it will land in your OneDrive, right? So I demonstrate that here a little bit. Um, but also, of course, I have done this already, so I'll show you how essentially this looks like. So usually you can do save a copy and drive, and then, you know, basically what's happening is that uh, this copy will be now essentially in your Google Drive space, and you can always access it. It will be yours, and uh, actually you can, you know, work on it. You can rename it, and if you want to look at all the Google Collab 
ones that are actually saved there, you simply can click on this and have this Google Drive, which is directly connected to, let's say, all this Google call-up ones. Some of you, some of the things you know already, we have seen here the, the convolution neural network, the artificial neural network from earlier lectures, the data understanding of the IMNEST. And now we basically have here this, this copy of a recommendation system or basically this Morris recommendation call-up that I had earlier in order to produce the slides. And you see the, the idea of the assignment is a little bit around these minutes here. So it's not a very long assignment. And here and there, I don't really require you to do the, let's say, to-dos in there. Rather, you will see that um, the slides have already the to-dos filled here and there so that you take it rather as a big walkthrough, then, you know, spend a lot of time. Of course, I would encourage you to think about the to-dos, but essentially for this 10% assignment, you don't need to do it. I show you in a couple of slides what I mean by this. Also think about, um, there was a, this, this discussion in the course, of course, think about when we do cloud computing, we usually wanted to connect to a, let's say, um, hosted runtime, right? We don't want to connect to a local runtime, a hosted runtime. That means before you start here executing anything, make sure like you'd have the same essentially in the HDF cloud, right? When we had the Jupyter Lab here, make sure that you connect to a kernel specifically hosted in that cloud. Now the similar idea in the Google call-up, you see essentially here that you connect to a certain hosted runtime. Now also here you would have the chance of changing the runtime type that you did perhaps before already with some you know elements um, for the deep learning for instance it was important to switch to GPUs by now you hopefully explore what that means if you do just CNNs with uh, CPUs it should be rather slow. Good, but of course the idea is now to execute all these different uh, cells that you have. Um, I was testing this, so I don't have problems right now, although the notebook is a bit older, but still um, captures the essence um, of what you should basically learn with this. Also here are elements which we know already, a pip on stall is part of the game, including of course many different imports that we already know from many different lecture parts now. He asked Escalern, NumPy, Pandas for data, um, lots of different elements. And it would be good to look through this and describe it in two, three lines in the assignment, right? So not on a line by line base, right? So this is too much and you don't need this. But here it would be interesting example. You could say, well, all the necessary libraries would be Im imported, like you say TensorFlow, for instance, or uh, SkyKit Learn or NumPy. And then you say also, well, by the way, we also install a couple of packages. So you see it's not only possible with SSH, it's also part of the Python script here. But it's what is really done essentially it uses a similar trick. So just executing it essentially in the runtime environment and installing here something called Altair, which is a very nice visualization package. If you uh, want to work with this very interactive visualization package, you learned already the meaning of an upgrade of something which is existing, just to be sure that maybe the latest greatest of some of these mechanisms. And you have even proprietary, um, let's say, uh, Python packages like the Google credentials here. But if that is all successfully um, actually created, and you will see, of course, when I now explain you something here online directly, you will see that some of these have yellow blocks. So I think they are much more important to learn and roughly what stands in there, which maps a little bit also to the assignment. You see here the Altair visualization library, which is very powerful actually. When you use in practice data science, it can do all sorts of things. So maybe something worth a look in. Of course, pipe plot is also always there. Uh, also very nice, you can zoom in, zoom out, but this has essentially another dimension really of colorful um, images and, and graphics. Good, I think I basically put here everything in this um, particular slide which is important and of course now we know the problem understanding so we want to have an interesting recommender for movies now when you have this problem and we understood it we want to do this embedded features and learn them of course the question is where we get the training examples right the so next is the data understanding phase and this is part here that we use a movie lens data set some of you probably already know that it's available in the big version and in a small version essentially where you have different number of ratings of let's say many different movies by very many users. 
Um, of course, the big data case is more made if you go to the 265 megabytes. And of course, this is still a simplified scenario if you have the real Netflixes and, you know, Amazon Primes they have much more data. This data can be easily downloaded. It's part of the script here. When I now execute this further, you know, basically you can go on and it will download the Movie Lens database um, data. It has essentially different columns, which we here, let's say, feature select. Um, like users, movies, and ratings. And uh, essentially, you have this columns, user ID, age, sex, occupation. So you see already different user properties and zip code. And uh, when you go through this, you understand a little bit more, um, basically, from the structure of the data um, and describe this a little bit would be very good. Now, um, this already brings us to, of course, the idea of data understanding. So what, what data is there? What can be used? for really modeling. And one graphical explanation would be perhaps this. We have different, let's say, features. We can do different statistics on them, like the age here, for instance. Uh, so almost all provided maybe the age here. Um, interesting enough, um, we see some some different elements, like the occupation is top uh, for students. So there's something where we have to um, look a little bit on the data, what is now, um, interesting let's say probability distributions um, you will see that the student for instance is a very specific type um, as we elaborate later um, and this way we also split the data in training and test that's what you already know from previous elements in deep learning so here it's the same idea of course the data that we have already we want to reproduce a matrix and we'll check then the matrix how good is it and in terms of doing so we can then go back to the optimization algorithm have a yardstick to minimize the error. And, and this is something, of course, what we do and prepare here a little bit, which is the next step in data preparation to basically the training samples from the movie lens need to be now cut into different pieces, the training and the test set to evaluate its performance properly. Now then you can do um, different statistics on the data, as I was alluding to, also to understand the data better and to prepare the modeling, also to say something about the, uh, about the usability of the model. And here in the in the assignment, and when you look in these, let's say, different fields here that I execute maybe in parallel here in the back, um, you will see certain different elements which are a bit, let's say, varying, where I also was alluding already to that the students, as interestingly enough, have probably lots of time to rate movies because you see that from all the different count of record, records here on um, the occupation from those that looked the movies are the students the most um, provided them. And here we would see even an unbalanced class problem, right? So the class of students have done so much in recommending that the recommender we learn from will be slightly biased towards students. There's no way around it. Otherwise, we would probably basically have to, let's say, uh, sample out some data and you see also the movie recommender we do for doctors will be probably also not so powerful because rare doctors actually have used the system. Probably doctors never have time, right? Or professors like me probably also have not time to rate movies much. So in this sense, um, this is always in the data and this important part of the data understanding. Here we use the Altair package to show a little bit on this insights, um, but you can have different, let's say, packages to do so. Must not be a, uh, this kind of Altair package and of course you can also look on other elements like age right so maybe people in a certain age class have just done this and this is of course something where you have to think about um, if your model that you generate is let's say good enough in this when you do these steps and describe them a little bit and do it yourself i think it becomes much more clearer than i can really you know press here in some buttons and show you you will see some interesting movies. Um, of course, some of them are used and looked more than, of course, many others. Star Wars is a good example. I bet almost everyone has seen it these days, but um, uh, except, of course, small child that would probably not rate or be not interesting in, in having a Netflix account yet. But essentially, this is something what you will explore via this Google Colab element and where you can also see the different um, perhaps um, gender here and there's a different bias perhaps too and the interesting thing is you can counteract on those which is a little bit also the learning experience in the assignment when you do this you will see the different ways how you can actually use this now this embedding or this this matrix factorization in order 
to get essentially this this impact a bit reduced, which is later in the kind of um, part here. This is what I meant when you when it comes to the idea of providing your solutions. You can easily skip this and go to the let's say solution part. You don't have to spend here time in the assignment for me to provide all you know this on your own. Of course, it makes sense to to think about briefly what are now the values, but you know as it is just a 10% assignment, don't worry about this. And if you you know do this uh, step by step as I do here in parallel, just as a demo, um, which is of course um, interesting in different areas. Um, see again uh, here the different elements and bias really to to the drama here, which I think is very obvious. Um, is another point or to comedy, while all other movies are very let's say rarely here in the count of records. Another indicator that there is perhaps a database a little bit biased and we have to work on this. Right, so, and, and to think about that, of course, to have the memory footprint now of this number of dimensions that we would have um, is something to think about. Um, you would think now making a 20D vector would be the best from the embedding, but of course that's not really realistic in the sense. So in, in the sense, um, you would have a big computing footprint. And through these iterations now with a learning rate, with a gradient descent optimizer, it work, keeps working on this matrix, right? And train this matrix factorization model in a way that essentially this matrix fits at some point in time, more or less as dot products that you have from the others and reflects your data that you already have, right? Which is your data set. And this is what we call the modeling step here of really learning and doing the this model. You see then when you execute further the um, the, the aspects of the um, element here. So we, I think it's it's pretty obvious how you basically should continue in this. So I stop here to to do this more interactively. But there will be elements here on evaluating the model. You see that we already say that the train error is essentially getting down. That's a good point. But is the test error really following suit, which is important? If it would go up, we would start overfitting perhaps. So there are lots of elements here um, where you can also play around. We also see then the computational footprint here. We do an embedding of dimension 30. As I said, if you would put 200s here, you quickly see a problem, um, I guess, in the scalability. And by this, you'd learn this Latin features over time um, through iterative learning through this um, SGD. And here essentially um, have then more scripts where you just roughly have to describe essentially what it's doing, where you of course want to evaluate the model a little bit, um, what you want to uh, basically then report in terms of evaluation. And is the model good enough? You will explore and then can work a little bit on, let's say the, um, let's say the problems that we said earlier. So popular Moodle, popular ones would be comedy or drama we have seen because essentially we had seen a bias in the data. So can we do something against the bias? And can we do something against this will be also one part of this. And uh, if you continue with the script, you see that has here and there some impact that also other um, basically movies suddenly can of course be higher ranked, uh, which is a very important parameter in this. So basically we do some model tuning and then we see that the model uh, training and test error become much more closer to each other. Good. And explaining then this poor quality can be uh, explained by different visualizations. Again, this is a very obvious one with the observed pairs of biases, but here's a more elaborate one called TSNE. It's a very advanced way of actually having this stochastic neighbor embedding um, that really shows you the embeddings or tries to show you the embeddings and how far they are from each other. And uh, looking at this a little bit is a learning experience of this assignment. So I continue here a little bit also in the light of the time to finish now. Um, basically, we have described here almost all about the matrix factorization. Um, and here are just always, let's say, elements to, to create, again, test and training sets. But of course, thinking about now the bias of reducing maybe somehow this impact of this drama bias um, and comedy biases and so forth. Good. And of course, there are many hyperparameters you could think of that you can steer, that you can change. That is also what we know from deep learning. The same is here, not only the embedding dimensions, again, the learning rate, how quickly you come downhill, basically when you think about our stochastic gradient descent 
and so forth and so forth. And you continue the modeling, would do more regularization and, and these elements. And with this, over time, you have probably a model which then really is much more improving by actually doing this iteratively again and again. And chances are then that with this evaluation, you come to some form of deployment where you say, even with the biases, we have counteracted on this and can come to a production deployment and now essentially sell your model to a movie streamer and basically to then, uh, you know, start using it at practice on the website, on their system, once the people choose movies. This was a, let's say, relatively quick walkthrough um, because also practical lectures, much more, um, you know, the idea of that you do this uh, yourself in the assignment, actually also perhaps learn and look what's around here. It describes it very well, in my opinion, what's happening there. And of course, we would have also in, in uh, basically several Thursdays now also where we can also discuss certain elements on it. I stop here um, and basically would stop the recording as well. And we continue with lecture 12, of course, next Tuesday.